And so let's begin our uh, scripture talk this morning. It's our final week of our teaching series on Jonah's journey. What an amazing book of the Bible, isn't it? And we've gone through chapter 1, 2, 3, and today is our final chapter, chapter 4. Now, let's, let's just go back down memory lane here. Where have we been in the last four weeks? It started off in chapter 1 where the word of the Lord came down to this man. His name was Jonah. And the Lord said, hey, Jonah, I've got a plan for your life. I want you to go to the city of Nineveh to proclaim the word of the Lord there. And so Jonah heard it listened to it, bought a ticket for a boat ride, and went the opposite direction to a city named Tarshish. As he's in the boat, he finds himself a nice quiet spot underneath, uh, near the bottom of the boat and was resting and sleeping. Meanwhile, God commissioned and appointed a wind to come. As the boat was at sea and the wind turned, those waves crashing upon that boat and those pagan sailors didn't know what to do. In fact, they started to look at each other going, hey, did, did you do something wrong? And this is why we're facing this storm out of nowhere. They started looking at each other, couldn't figure it out. And finally, they remembered, hey, there's this guy at the bottom of the boat who's sleeping. Maybe it's his fault. So they go, they wake him up. And sure enough, Jonah begins to tell them his story. And he says to them, yeah, guys, it, it, this, this, all that this is happening right here is my fault. You see, God spoke to me clearly, and I'm supposed to be in Nineveh, and I'm living in disobedience. I'm going the opposite direction. And so the only way out of this storm, the only way you're going to survive is if you throw me overboard. Well, of course, these sailors are like, oh, man, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be the ones who have your blood on our hands. And they tried to keep fighting this storm, and it wasn't working. And so what did they do? They threw him over. And so you can only imagine what Jonah is going through. He's trying to keep his head above water. He's trying to stay afloat, but obviously there's no chance he's going to survive this. I mean, barely the boat is trying to stay afloat. Assuredly, Jonah's going down, and so he starts descending down into the bottom of the water. And then God's grace and his mercy and his deliverance and his salvation comes on the scene. God appoints, he speaks and he directs a large fish to come at that just very moment where Jonah is about to die and rescues him, swallows him rather than chews him. And there Jonah in chapter 2 is sitting in the belly of this fish for three days and three nights. We can only imagine what that was like, right? Anybody experience that? And so there he is, and he says some amazing words in the belly of this great fish. He starts to realize, boy, I, I need God. I need to do life God's way because when I try to do it my own way, it doesn't work out, does it? And here he was, even amidst my disobedience, God had enough grace and mercy upon my life to save me, to rescue me by sending this large fish, and here I am still breathing. He gets so excited in the belly of this fish. He says, I, I will shout grateful praise to you. I will sacrifice to you, God. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. Wow, he had an encounter with God, didn't he? And then in that moment of confession and, and, and a recommitment to the cause of, of the Lord, God allows this fish to vomit him out on the seashore. Then I love the way chapter 3 starts, right? Powerful words. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Aren't you glad for the second time around? Aren't you glad that though at times you miss it, at times you walk the other direction, God doesn't write you off? And he says, I'm not done with you. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And so he comes to Jonah a second time. He says, Jonah, are you ready? I need you to go to Nineveh. And immediately this time, Jonah responds out of obedience and goes to the city of Nineveh, to proclaim the word of the Lord. And what does he do there? As he walks through this great city, the city that is rich in affluence and rich in resources, but also rich in sin, Jonah begins to tell them, listen, 40 days and this place is done. Destruction is coming. And when the word of the Lord comes out, the people of Nineveh, these pagans who are so far from God, begin to turn from their wicked ways and actually turn to God. 
In fact, the king sends down an edict and says, listen, we got to start fasting. We've got to grieve over our sin and we got to turn our lives around. And we, who knows, he says, who knows, maybe God will relent from bestowing this destruction upon us. And then I love the way chapter three ends. When God saw that they did what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Wow, the Lord had grace not only on Jonah, but he had great mercy and compassion upon these pagan Ninevites who were, who, who were murderers and violent. Now, before we go to chapter 4, if you don't know the story, what do you expect to read in chapter 4? What do you expect? You, what do you expect from this prophet, okay, who was called by God, privileged, to go and proclaim the word of the Lord to these people. And then he realizes disobedience and then God's salvation and, and his whole prayer from the belly of the fish saying, God, I'm yours. I'm ready to proclaim your salvation story wherever you want me to go. And then he goes and he sees that God actually uses him and he rescues the people. 120,000 of people. There comes a revival in the city of Nineveh. What do you expect the prophet to be like in chapter 4. Yeah, God, you're awesome. What a privilege it has been. Lord, it's amazing how you used me, this disobedient prophet, and you rescued me. I was dying, and you saved me, and then you vomited me out, and, and you gave me a second chance. And, and then on top of it, they actually listened to me, and they actually turned from their ways. God, you're off the church. Send me to the next city. Don't you, honestly, don't, isn't that what we expect? Oh boy, let's read chapter four. Let's read chapter four, the word of the Lord today. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. <laughs> God, you're wrong. You're you're wrong on this one. You've made a mistake here, God. In fact, I am ticked. I'm angry. What? Are you sure this isn't a typo? He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord? When I was still at home, remember? When I was disobedient? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew... I had a feeling, I had a hunch that you're gracious and you're compassionate. You're slow to anger. He's saying, you're slow to anger and abounding in love. And God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, you know what? Take away my life. For it's better for me to die than to see this happen. What? It's better for me to die than to live and see these worthless people come to know you. Next slide. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? What is he angry about, friends? Honest, honest question. Why is he angry? What's his problem? Jonah had gone out, sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Can you just imagine this moment? He walks out in the suburbs, and he's making himself shelter. Just, I can't believe he did that. I can't believe. And watch what happens here. It's like, I'm going to take my ball and I'm going to play somewhere else. He's sitting there. He's watching. All upset. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant. And made it grow up over Jonah. And gave, to give him what? Shade. I wonder if he had hair problems like me. Didn't have a hat. 
made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. <laughs> Jonah was very happy about the plant. Talk about circumstantial happiness. Right? When everything is going great in our lives and with career is on track and funds are available and health is there, we're like, oh, I can't get enough of this. And then something goes wrong and it's like, he's all over the map. He's all happy now because he's got shade. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered away. It's amazing. Just as a side note here, God speaks and things and people obey him all throughout the book of Jonah. Speaks to the waves, waves come up, storms, pagan sailors turn to him, begin to worship him. He commands fish and fish obey him. The fish obeys him again, vomits him, Jonah out. God commands a plant to grow, commands a worm to chew. Everybody's obeying. Everything is obeying except for the prophet. And it's interesting. But he's happy now. The plant's there. But the worms arrive. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. God must be thinking, i got to teach this guy a lesson because he's ain't, he ain't getting it. You'd think he would have learned. You know, you remember that fish incident, Jonah? He wanted to die. He, Jonah said, he, he grew so faint, he wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Next slide, follow me, brother. Come on. I don't think I'm that boring. Stay awake with me. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? <laughs> I wonder if we've got plant issues in our life, plant problems, things that, that we get really upset about, and I wonder if God's saying plant issues. Yeah. One of the things that kind of, kind of bothers me is when Somebody gets out of the door and bangs my car and dings my door. It's like, <laughs> Waiters and waitresses, just not on it. Let's go, let's go. We get all upset about a lot of things, right? I wonder if God's saying that, that's a plant problem. So he asks Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? This is his chance, right? This is his chance to say, yeah, what am I thinking? What am I doing? Why am I so upset? These people can't. This is his chance, right? To say, God, you're right. What am I doing? No, he says, yeah, it is. It is. I do. I, I have a right to be angry. And I'm so angry that I wish I was dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for this great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? Now, some scholars say that that 120,000 might be referring to just the children in the city which is why they says they, don't, they cannot tell the right hand from their left. So potentially, some scholars believe that Nineveh actually had more than half a million people in it. And so, so God is saying to him, don't you think that is more important than your shade? Than your plant? Shouldn't I be concerned more about that and them than your shade? So I, I've been meditating on this passage and applying it to my own life. And do we really want revival? 
Do we really want it? Do we really understand what revival will cost us? Because in this case, revival came to the city, and the prophet of the Lord, quite frankly, didn't like it. Why? What was he angry about? What was he angry about? Revival changes everything. Are we sure we want revival? Revival changes everything. Are you sure we want it? In some ways, I'm going to tongue-in-cheek, really challenge us. Do you, are you really sure you're in on this? We pray we want people to come to faith and not just kind of one or two, but multiple amounts of families and people through our ministry and our church. And are you sure you really want it? Because I'm a, I'm a believer that healthy things grow and growing things change. Healthy things grow, and growing things change. Would you agree? If you have a family, you have children, as they grow, things change. Relationships change, their dynamic in our households change. Same with, with the work of the Lord. As things grow, as, as healthy things grow, there will be change that happens. The church we know today will be a lot different than the church in five or ten years from now. Because... It will have grown. And I wonder if this is part of what Jonah struggled with. And so here are some thoughts. Are you sure you want revival? Maybe here are some thoughts that Jonah struggled with. First one is this. Revival will cost us our comfort. Revival will cost us our comfort. I mean, think about Jonah's journey even before the revival happened. God, Jonah, had to risk his life. Jonah was Jewish. The Ninevites were Gentiles. His preference was that God would extend his wrath upon them. That was his preference. He was Jewish. They were Gentiles. They were pagans. And he was risking his life. Remember, these people were, were ruthless. For fun, they would stack human skulls at the front of their gates, almost like trophies. They'd have these poles at the, city, uh, at the city gate where they would impale people and let them die by the scorching heat. I, I don't mean to gross you out, but this was the reality. So when God taps jo uh, Jonah, he's thinking, I might end up on a pole. I'm not doing that. I'd rather go the opposite way. You see, it, he had to come out of his comfort zone. We're going to have to leave our comfort zone. We're going to have to make friends and, and build relationships with people that come from different places and different socioeconomic backgrounds and, and different languages and different foods and different dress. And we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone. It's going to cost us some comfort. You see, God will call his servants to do some difficult things and reach some difficult people. Are you okay with that? Because that's, that's what it's going to cost us. It's amazing that we live in the city that we live in. And there are thousands of people coming from all over the world, but they're, they may be different than you and different than me. They might come from a different socioeconomic background. They might have greater education or less education. They might be very different than you. In Jonah's case, they were so different, he didn't like them, hence he didn't want God's grace over their lives. It kind of messed with his comfort zone. It messed with his cultural milieu. What about people in our community that have different lifestyles that may not necessarily be pleasing to the Lord? How will we treat them? What if God begins to bring them in our midst and they begin to belong to us even though they don't believe yet. Are we okay with that? It's going to make it a little bit uncomfortable, isn't it? And part of us is going to say, well, I don't know if I want them here. Jonah was like that. I, I want to stay with my Jewish friends. But yet God has a heart for all people. All people. And so it's going to cost us our comfort. God will teach us to make decisions not based on our personal preferences. We all have preferences, don't we? 
We have preferences in music, preferences in art, preferences in entertainment, preferences in, 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 in church, preferences in speakers. Prefer- we, have, we all have preferences. I have preferences. But I have to many times push my personal preferences aside and make decisions as to what's best for all. What's best for the community rather than what I want? It's going to cost us our personal preferences. You see, one of the challenges that the New Testament church faced was the influx of Gentile believers in predominantly Jewish churches. And so revival will cost us our church the way we know it. You see, in the New Testament, those predominantly Jewish churches started to see an influx of Gentile believers come into their churches. And and if you read many of Paul's letters to these churches, what is he talking to them about? Unity. Love each other. Work out your difficulties. Why? Because there started to become friction. The Jewish community started to feel, man, who are these guys? They come in here and they think they own the place. You know what, guys? In fact, if you want to be part of us, you've got to do a few things. You've got to get circumcised. You've got to do this, that, and the other. And there started to be tension in the early church. And so Paul has to write them letters and say, hey, listen, we're all one in Christ. We've got to figure out a way. Though we are different than one another, we have one that is similar. That is Jesus. That's why he writes to the Ephesian church so clearly. He says to them, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups, and in this case was Jews and Gentiles, he's made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier between them, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. Did you get that? We're part of the human family. That's what Paul is telling them. Don't divide yourself from your your different cultural backgrounds and and exclude one another. No, 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 you're one human family. That's why I love the fact that Canada has opened its borders to, to refugees. I am thrilled when I hear of families taking on these refugees' families just as they they're they're their own. That's that's a gospel piece of what God dreams of for the church to be like thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. You see, God will challenge us to rethink the way we compare others to ourselves and our cultures. Let's let's face it, we, we compare, don't we? There's this word called egocentrism. The, the key word here is ego. Sometimes we can fall into this trap and say, I am the standard of success. I am the standard of what everybody else is compared to. And if they meet my standard, then they're in. Thumbs up. If they don't meet my standard and my my perspectives, they're out. I label them. I don't have time for them. That's called egocentrism. Friend, what makes you think you're the standard? Who gave you that right to be superior over everybody else? They're not weird. They're just different than you. Maybe we can learn something from each other. Apart from this thing called egocentrism, there's this thing called ethnocentrism. The word ethno is important. It's the same, it's the same mentality, only sometimes we, 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 we make our ethnic background the standard. And we say, my ethnicity is the best ethnicity that everybody has to kind of be compared to. And if they fit right on, you guys come on in. If they don't meet the standard, out you go. That's called ethnocentricity. It's when we reject entire people groups that God has created and woven intricately, skillfully, with a plan and a purpose over their life. Who am I in my cultural background as a European, let's say? Who am I to say I'm the standard? You see, God has created us to be part of the human family. 
That's why I love this church. We're not focused just on one ethnicity. Every cultural background is welcome in this place. We worship God together. We find our common ground because it's the Jesus way. But it's going to cost us some comfort, right? We're going to have to learn about each other's culture. We're going to have to be open to, to hearing, maybe even learning a language, maybe trying different foods. And we have to get out of our comfort zone. You sure you want revival? Apparently Jonah didn't. He didn't like this influx of Gentiles joining the kingdom. He had a feeling this was going to happen. Friends, if revival hits Canada, it's going to be a multi-ethnic revival. And if you don't like that, you won't like heaven. Because heaven is going to be a multi-ethnic worship experience forever in eternity. Secondly, revival will cost us resources. Just a thought here. Revival will cost us resources. Resources can include people, it can include finances, and it can include time. And it's not a, 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 an exhaustive list here, but here are some thoughts. If God would send a revival in our region, in our country, don't you think it would radically change our church? Think about what would happen. If not just a family or two or three families, but what about if multitudes of people start coming to faith? It would change the way we do church, wouldn't it? It would affect our people challenge, our resource challenge when related to people. It happened in the early church. It shouldn't surprise us. In Acts 6, what happened? The church is growing. Sometimes we just go to Acts 2. Peter stands up and he preaches boldly. He's empowered by the Spirit. And what happens that day? Three thousand people come to know jesus right and then the word says that every day the family of god was added to every day every day every day every day every day finally in act six something starts to break there's a group of widows they're there they're like hey you guys haven't served us any food do you remember us back in the day we were never neglected. You guys had enough. We were served. We were blessed. Now what? Now that this church's getting bigger, what's going on here? What was happening? There's a pressure point. Because the church had grown, the same group of people, the apostles, couldn't serve all the needs anymore. Because the more people, the more needs. So what happened? A key change happened in the early church. They started to commission deacons, leaders who would help the apostles so that the apostles could focus on preaching the word and prayer. These deacons would help serve the needs of the people. And you see this transition over throughout the New Testament. They had to change the way they did things as God brought growth. You can't do the same thing when you're 200 people than when you're 2,000 people or when you're 20,000 people. Things have to change. Healthy things grow, growing things change. But let's face it, change can sometimes be hard. Would you agree? And sometimes as much as God is growing the kingdom, there could be this temptation to say, oh, for the old days. Where everybody knew me and I knew everybody. Yeah, there's something beautiful about that. And you need to invest in those relationships. But God has a big heart for all of humanity. And there's work to do. There's expanding the kingdom. It's going to cost us. It's going to cost us. It's going to cost us our resources, even our finances. The more people, what? The more spaces you need, the larger spaces you need, the more ministries. Well, you need resources to do all that because the work of God gets resourced by the people of God. We're kind of trying to figure that thing out ourselves, aren't we? God has blessed this congregation. He's, he's helped us to reach many new families. Some of you are right here right now. We're so grateful you're here with us. But we've had to create bigger spaces. 
more gatherings in order to accommodate. And that's challenged our resources, our finances. God is stretching our generosity levels. That's why in, in the New Testament, it says all the believers were together and had everything in common. They, said they, they sold property and possessions and to give to anyone who had a need. They started to realize, man, in order to, to meet the needs, we got to share. we got to be generous. It'll cost us that. It'll cost us time. Do we want revival? Because it'll cost us. It'll cost us. Third thought, revival will cost us a level of spiritual peace. Follow me on this. You might say, boy, what, what, what are you talking about? We have the, the peace of Christ in our life. That, absolutely, absolutely. But when you are in the front lines of ministry, when you are in the front lines of kingdom advancement, when you are in the front lines of doing what God has asked you to do, and you're making a difference in people's lives, get ready, because the kingdom of darkness doesn't like you. You see, I am convinced that the evil one doesn't bother with churches who are dying and not impacting their community and world. Why waste? They're not advancing the kingdom. They're dying. They're, they're, they don't have a vision of reaching others. They're, they're, they're closed in. They're, they don't care about the poor. They don't care about, they're just concerned about their own entertainment. Why does he bother with them? What he bothers with is churches that have a vision, that are that, that, that are all about their vision and doing whatever it takes to fulfill the vision of expanding the kingdom of God. Those churches, you better believe he's got a plan to bring it down. Because he knows if you keep doing this, lives will be changed by Christ. And he's not about that. He's not about that. So there will be a backlash from the kingdom of darkness when churches say, sign us up, God, we'll do whatever it takes, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what, what socioeconomic background, whether male, female, young, older, doesn't matter, we're ready, God, we're ready. In the last couple of years, I know I've shared this, but my family and I have experienced more spiritual warfare than in all of our lives. If, if you talk to our staff members, if you talk to our deacons, if you talk to leaders in our congregation, they'll probably tell you the same thing. Why is that? Because we're serious about building the kingdom. We're not playing games. We're serious about it. And so we, the heat goes up. The heat goes up. God will teach us to be even more dependent on prayer than ever before. We'll realize this thing is bigger than ourselves. God, we need you today. We need you tomorrow. All the way through this, God, we, we need you. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 6.18, he says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and with all kinds of requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Why is Paul saying this to the church of Ephesus? He's saying, you guys are in the front lines. You're serious about advancing the kingdom. You're serious about reaching Jews and Gentiles. It doesn't matter to you. Well, then you better be praying all the way through it because the evil one's going to want to destroy that work. He wants to destroy leaders. He wants to destroy, he wants to bring division so that it all comes to a halt. He wants to stop projects. He wants, he wants to do that. And so... Are you sure you want revival? Because there will be a backlash from the evil one. And we need to be ready for it. We need to be alert. And we need to stand firm and say, God, we ain't doing this on our own, but we're going to do it with your help. We're not backing down. We're not afraid. We're going to fear not, for you are with us. You want revival? I conclude with, with this. As I, I've been reflecting on the story of Jonah, it's been... I hope it's been a challenge to you. It's been a, such a challenge to me. But I, I, I think of the character of Jonah, and then I, and then I, I, I thought of the Apostle Paul, how, how they're both in so contrast to each other. Follow me on this. Jonah wants to die because the Ninevites accepted the word of the Lord, right? He doesn't want to see it. He'd rather die and not see it. Paul, on the other hand, 
and the gospel, they were rejected. He was rejected by the Jews, yet he wants to die taking the gospel to them. See the difference? Jonah doesn't want to see it happen. He'd rather die. And Paul's like, put me right there so that I can die so they can hear Christ. In fact, he says it in Romans 9, 2 and 3. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Think about that. He has this unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Are you getting the heart of Paul here? He's like, if I had a chance to put myself in the cursing so that they could find Jesus, I'd do it. That's how deep his passion was to reaching them with the message of Christ. Jonah, on the other hand, I don't even want to see that happen. I'd rather die in complete contrast to one another. And just as a side note, you want to study this more? The elder brother in the New Testament of the story of the prodigal son is a Jonah in the New Testament. His brother comes home, his father throws him a lavish party, and he's like, I don't want to be part of this. I don't want to be part of this celebration. This wicked son comes back, and next thing you know, he's back into the inheritance. Forget that. It's going to cost me part of my inheritance now. That's just a side note. Read it during the week. Here's another contrast between Jonah and Paul. Jonah was asked to leave his comfort zone and take a message to people whom he didn't like. He didn't like them. Is there, are, are there people groups or, or people or demographics in our city where, if you're honest, you just don't like them? Jonah was asked to go preach the word of the Lord to them, the ones he didn't like. Paul, on the other hand, did so with great passion. Look at what Paul says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. You really get the heart of Paul. And Pastor Chris and the team, you could come up, but, but listen to the words of the Lord. Don't be distracted. It says, though I am free, Paul says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. Why? To win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, guess what? I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. Why do I do this? I do all of this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. You see that? Paul's like, I, I, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. If I need to learn a language, if I need to to welcome a refugee family into my family, if I need to, if I, if, if, if I need to barbecue with my neighbors, if whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. If I could just share Christ with somebody. Rather than being a reluctant prophet who ends up being used by God, who ends up forgetting of God's mercy on his own life. And stands in the suburbs of town and says, I don't even want to see this. We don't know how Jonah's story ends. The Bible doesn't give it to us. But boy, is it challenging. Boy, is it challenging. My prayer is that it's in the DNA of our church. That we have such a deep urgency and passion. Who knows, what if Easter becomes this amazing event this year that your family members your neighbors your friends you take a risk and make an ask and say you you come what about if multitudes of people come to know christ because there's a people at heartland who aren't so concerned with their own comfort zone or are willing to take themselves out of that comfort zone so they could share jesus with somebody 
Imagine what would happen. It's going to cost us, isn't it? Are you sure you want revival? I thought I conclude in the first gathering, I didn't even have this in my nose. I just felt the Lord just remind me of this occurrence in my life that I'll never forget. Last week, I shared a little bit of some of our opportunities to share the word of the Lord in, in all sorts of different contexts. And I remember two occurrences, one in Romania, and I was in a, a few hours out of Bucharest, and, and it was an outdoor gathering service, and I was preaching, and, I, and, and, and the Romanians were all sitting in front of me. And then I, I noticed there was all sorts of people in trees lined up around where the people were seated. They were of a different skin color. They were the Roma people. After the gathering was over, I, I, I went to the pastor and said, why are there so many of the Roma people on the trees and not part of the gathering? And he says, well, they're kind of, you know, they're kind of outcasts. You know, they're kind of different than the Romanians, and many of them think they're going to, like, rob them. And so they, they're just, they're allowed to stay in the trees, but not gather in the middle. <laughs> After the gathering, we had this potluck. I got to tell you, I took a little bit of a risk. And I went tree to tree, and I said, you come down here, you sit right over here. Right over here. Friends, we got to do that. Who have you put on the tree of your life, on the outskirts? Stay over there. You can hear it from a distance, but you can't come have dinner with me. You need to die to the egocentrism in your life because God loves that person in that tree. Loves that person. They might be different than you, but God created them, and His image is upon their life, and He died for them. Think of Christ being in very nature God, perfect without any sin. He made Himself sin so that you and I could have life. How could we ever push anybody to the sideline of our churches when Jesus did that for you?